Margaret Hodges, the street fighting Labour MP who took on the BMP's Nick Griffin and defeated him, but then was at the absolute epicentre of this crusade, a huge crusade that she was very much part of against the scourge of tax avoidance. Rich people and multinational corporations refusing to pay the tax that Parliament over there expected them to pay. She's got a new book out, uh, Called to Account, about her experiences. Definitely buy it. There's a little plug for her, she'll be happy. But I want to talk to her about the scourge of tax avoidance. What is it and what can we do about it? Just explain what the Public Accounts Committee is, because a lot of people go, I don't know what that is, don't care. What is it? It's the oldest committee in the House of Commons. It was founded by Gladstone. It's supposed to follow the money. When it was founded in 1861, it looked after what would have been the equivalent of about seven or eight billion pounds worth of money. Today, we follow 770 billion pounds worth of money. It's a fair whack. I was the first elected chair. Before that, it was always an appoint appointed by the party leaders and the whips. But I was elected by the whole house, and I'm the first female chair. But when First thing that happens is you get told you're given a room. Down one side of the wall is the pictures of all my predecessors. And I discovered that there were more people who'd been murdered as chairs of the Public Accounts Committee than they had prime ministers. Wow. So I'm waiting for Google ever go. <laughs> and then, <laughs> more seriously, we're a cross-party committee. But between us, we managed to produce 246 unanimous reports. And on tax avoidance, all of them, from the extreme right to the extreme left, couldn't get enough of the uh, investigations we did into tax avoidance in Britain today. What is the difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion? I talk about it being a spectrum, and I put in tax planning, tax avoidance, tax evasion. So tax planning is what's acceptable, tax evasion is what is illegal, and tax avoidance is somewhere uh, in the middle. You know, it's become a convenient way to say avoidance is okay, evasion is not and I don't think avoidance is okay. Just exploiting the inevitable ambiguities in the tax law simply to avoid paying taxes, no other purpose but to avoid paying taxes, is morally reprehensible and wrong. Businesses will go, hang on a minute, you're the MP, you write the law, we were abiding by it. If you don't like the laws, change them. Everybody says that to me, the businesses, the advisors, uh, the lawyers, all of them say, it's your fault you've written bad law. And I accept some culpability. I think we should write less law in tax, and I wish, think we should write it clearer. But if we could really write law that had absolutely no ambiguities, no back uh, loopholes, we'd have done so. But the mere fact that there is an army of the big four earning two billion pounds a year out of tax advice, the lawyers, mm. the banks, all looking for these tax loopholes demonstrates that however well you write the law, you'll never avoid the loopholes. There are just too many different circumstances. The Tories have done loads of tax avoidance, haven't they? Well, they've done, I mean, they've been facing both ways. They did lead on the attempt to rewrite the international rules, and we're in the middle of that. And if that succeeds, that'll be a bit better. They did make the right noises and put more resources into the tax authorities, so they, they focus on tax avoidance. But at the same time, they introduce changes in our tax system, which actually creates tax haven style conditions like Ireland, like Luxembourg, like the British Virgin Isles here in the UK. And my worry, my real concern with Brexit, if we bring it into that context, is that the only, the, the government will think that the only way we can survive post-Brexit will be by creating tax haven conditions here in the UK. All you do there is create a race to the bottom. You make a short-term advantage, but capital is very promiscuous, and it'll come here for a bit, and then when somebody else does an even lower tax rate, it'll disappear. A lot of people go, hang on a minute, this is pretty cheeky. You were in government for 13 years. Why did you, what, why did Labour fail to clamp down on all these loopholes? I don't excuse the Labour government's failure to do that, and I think we were in, and I think it's the same with this government, actually. People are scared of business, big business. David Gork, yeah. who was in charge of all this tax, came up to me at one point and said to me, do you realise all this work you're doing? You're putting people off coming to set their businesses up here because they're worried they'll be done over by the Public Accounts Committee. And I laughed at him because I thought it was a joke. Then I realised he was serious. And I think there's that fear there yeah. of business which Gordon Brown and the two Eds had and... Um, 
which is a hangover to David Gork and his and, and David Cameron, and we'll see how Theresa May handles it. The big accountancy firms, they're seconded to the Treasury, they help design the tax laws, then they tell their clients how to avoid the very laws they themselves have helped to design. Yep. The very people who exploit the loopholes are the ones who came into Treasury to give the advice mm. as to how to write the technical rules for a new tax relief or a new uh, tax law that government wants to bring in. The best example I've got of, of that behaviour was over a, a new tax relief that was actually introduced first by the Labour government and then mm. implemented by the coalition government. This was called the patent box tax relief. This guy, Jonathan Bridges from KPMG, is seconded into Treasury to write the technical rules. He does that for six months. He comes out and the first thing he does when he goes back into KPMG is produce a brochure saying, patent box, what's in it for you? Poacher turned gamekeeper, mm. gamekeeper and then back he becomes a poacher again. And I thought that was really, really appalling uh, behavior. I think that revolving door syndrome is one of the most insidious um, observations I had in the years of, of, of looking at tax. There's a small little clique of tax professionals and they hide behind the complexity to avoid being accountable for what they do. We've got to toughen up, tighten up the rules so that if you do come in and support Treasury in writing new legislation, you are forbidden yeah. from having anything to do with it afterwards. Could we imagine a situation where benefit claimants were seconded to the Department of Work and Pensions <laughs> for legislation on Social Security? What is so awful is that if it was a benefit claimant, we'd be pursuing them with all the force of the law and we'd be publicising their names. And in the tax world, we're, uh, we're worried about pursuing, I mean, we're not even as strong as the French or the Spaniards yeah. or our European partners in pursuing Google or look at, you know, Europe and Apple, you know, uh, we're the least aggressive. And then we, when we do find people guilty, you don't see their names plastered mm. all over everything. David Hartnett, he was the former head uh, of Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. But I think he's a big fan of yours, Margaret, but he, <laughs> he ended up working for a major accountancy firm, but that's a very <coughs> common thing. And a bank. And a bank. Now, why is that a problem? Goldman Sachs, again, had tried to aggressively avoid tax by paying their people offshore in a company. And that means they didn't have to pay national insurance mm -hmm. and they could also hide the generous bonuses they were giving to their partners. About 20 companies, 30 companies had done the same deal. HMRC declared it unlawful. All the companies, except for Goldman Sachs, gave in. Goldman Sachs refused to give, it, give, give in. So HMRC started pursuing them with courts and should have pursued them for the total sum plus the interest lost. But they did a deal behind closed doors, which let Goldman Sachs off. We still to this day don't know how much. Within six months, Dave Hartnett had got a job with one of the big four and, had, and became an advisor to HSBC. When we later came to our hearing on HSBC, of all the uh, Europeans who'd hidden their money in Swiss bank accounts, he knew about that, Dave Hartnett, before he got, certainly before he got the job yeah. with HSBC, but before he had a meeting with HSBC to discuss an Anglo-Swiss agreement uh, on banking. So it just feels, I've no idea whether the guy did anything right or wrong, but the perception, you feel it's wrong, and he exploits his knowledge yeah. from inside HMRC to the advantage yeah. of HSBC. The tax gap. What's the tax gap? The tax gap is the difference between what we do get in in tax and what we should get in in tax. What is depressing is that HMRC calculated it being somewhere around £34 billion. It started at the end of the Gordon Brown era and that gap hasn't moved as defined by HMRC. There's another figure that tax campaigners use of £120 billion. Pounds. You're talking huge no, sums here, £34 billion yeah. to £120 billion. But if you settle that somewhere in the middle of about £70 billion... Pounds, you could do a think, fair amount of, with £70 billion, couldn't think, you? And every year, this is the other depressing thing, hidden in HMRC accounts, they write off £5 billion pounds, and they hide in their accounts because they know it's uncollectible, another £10 billion. So we're talking 
mega, mega, mega bucks that could really help us at a time when public money is tight and people are struggling to pay their taxes. Local coffee shops, local bookshops, they just have to pay their tax, don't they? And actually HMRC will come knocking on the door pretty pronto if they get their tax form wrong. I mean, it's one rule for those at the top and one rule for everybody else. These small businesses are getting forced out of business by these big corporations, aren't they? One of the things that people used to say, uh, in fact, I think the Labour front bench felt at that time, the two Eds, Ed Balls and Ed Miliband felt, that what we were pursuing was an anti-business agenda. Yeah. We weren't. We were pursuing a pro-fairness agenda. If you're a Starbucks and you're refusing to pay your tax, you can offer a cheaper cup of coffee. And then you're competing with the local community-based coffee shop, which is a British business, yeah probably providing British jobs. It's unfair. The reputational damage, certainly that Starbucks had when we exposed them, uh, means that it's not good business. And I know we somehow damaged Starbucks because I had this really bizarre encounter with them. They came into House of Commons and got a cup of not very good House of Commons coffee um, and offered me 20 million quid. I mean, what? In tax? Not what? as a bribe. I mean, as a bribe. I was going to say, what? Not, this is no, a bit no. of a revelation, Margaret, honestly. <laughs> uh. But what, what's <laughs> absurd about that is how can they decide yeah. what as to a whim. give to deal with a PR, yeah. a bit of a PR disaster? Rather than by the man of the law, they'll go, oh, on a whim, we'll give you this amount yeah. of money as an act of charity almost yeah. on that part. The only way you and I are going to be, con well, I am going to be convinced that what Starbucks pays is fair or what Google, when they paid £130 million, is fair is if we can see that negotiation between... Mm. So I think we've got to lift the lid on, on and make it all transparent so we know what happens. Otherwise, it's just inexplicable. But every time I suggest it, people's response to me is, oh, it would damage business. I don't think it would. And the other response is, it's also complicated, Margaret. You wouldn't understand it, which really riles me. So that's tax avoidance, thoroughly explained, I think. Now we've got loads of other interviews up, up there, as ever. Uh, loads more interviews to come, so do subscribe. I want to hear your comments, leave them down there. Uh, and as ever, I'll see you next time.